Good morning and good evening everyone. Now as a part of our today's session, we'll be understanding what is deep learning and we'll get some general intuition about deep learning. We'll proceed ahead and get some high level understanding about image processing and then we'll do a hands on session where we'll make use of brain tumor detection. Uh, that means I'm having the set of images where the images belongs to the person having a brain tumor and the another set of images which do not belong to the brain tumor and I'll be training my deep learning model to differentiate between those two classes. And to do this we will make use of the technique of transfer learning and this transfer learning that I'll be applying. I'll be making use of CNN architecture that is convolutional neural network. Okay, so that's the agenda of today's session. So introduction to deep learning. So why do we have to use this deep learning? Why can't I use a machine learning or any other tools and technology which is available out there? And why do we actually use this deep learning and why do we see like lot a lot of companies using this deep learning the reason because the traditional algorithms that we have these traditional algorithms will will become stagnant i mean after some time the accuracy that we would get from the models will not improve when the when there is increase in data but with the help of deep learning we'll be able to achieve better and better accuracy even when there is an increase in the amount of data so that's the advantage of using this deep learning guys and we see this application of deep learning in many fields be it in speech recognition image classification natural language processing many more so we use we see this application of deep learning in wide variety of spaces and whenever someone talks about deep learning you'll see a figure that would look like this so a, a deep learning or whenever someone is talking about deep learning it would some look something as uh, okay there will be something as an input and there will be something as an output and in middle will have something as an hidden so these three parts that you would see input hidden and output so these three parts are the components of any deep learning neural network now through this input layer we'll receive the input and my computation would happen in my hidden layer and in my output layer I'll be displaying the output so that is how we would do in case of deep learning neural network I'll get the data from input I'll process in my hidden layers and whatever the data that I'll process I'll give as an output using my output layer now that's the high level view uh, if I want to talk about deep learning guys Okay, now this connection that you see between the layers. So this connections represents or this arrows represent the connection between those respective layers and if I have uh, Like connection between like every neuron so individual component that you see over here. So this is called as neuron so If I have a connection between one neuron from previous layer to every other neuron in my next layer Then we are going to call this network as a dense network Okay, and the reason that uh, we have used this uh, kind of a structure because this deep learning has been developed to or this deep learning has been made uh, what I can say like it has been made as a uh, it has been developed after the uh, uh, like influence or after we have or like we wanted to imitate the working of the human brain. So because of that reason, so we wanted to have some kind of a processing system which will actually mimic the way we human learn. So just like we humans have our sensory organs to receive the data from the outside world or to feel the things that we want to see in the outside world. So we'll have the input layer. Okay in our deep learning neural network and just like we in our brain cell we have numerous uh, Neurons that we have that is called as biological neurons just like we have millions of neurons in our deep learning neural network We are going to have this kind of artificial neurons And just like we respond to it after we process the information in our brain Like in other words, we are going to give the output right so in the same way in my deep learning I'll, I'm going to have my output layer so deep learning is an artificial intelligence function that imitates the working of the human brain in processing the data and creating the patterns for use in decision making. Okay, so that's what deep learning would mean. Now let's get some uh, general intuition behind this uh, deep learning guys. So as I mentioned already 
the way this deep learning or this concept of deep learning came so it's inspired by the way that we have in our human brain so just like in my human brain or a single cell of a neuron it will have my it will have dendrites which receives the sensory organ information and i'm going to have some nucleus which processes the information that i receive through dendrites and this axon is nothing but the layer i mean like whatever the information that gets processed in the nucleus it passes through the axon and through the axon terminals the informations would be sent out to the other biological neurons in the same way this is just a representation if i take a single neuron in my artificial neural network or a deep learning neural network i'm going to have my input layer in place of dendrites and just like we have a nucleus which process the information we are going to have some kind of a mathematical function inside a neuron to process this incoming data and just like we have axon terminals to give the output and which decides whether i should trigger my next neuron or not in my deep learning neural network we are going to have my output layer and we are also going to have an activation function which decides whether i should process or whether i should send out this output from my neuron or not so that's the uh, comparison or th that's how we actually uh, compare it between our single human brain a single brain cell and a single artificial neuron and this single artificial neuron we sometimes we we also call it as a perceptron okay so coming to the mathematical intuition behind it so suppose if i have inputs like this x1 and uh, this should be x2 x3 and x4 and let's suppose i'm having the weights as w1 w2 w3 and w4 now to process this incoming data i'm going to do two things over here one is the summation that means i'm going to multiply my inputs with the weights and along with this i'm going to add my bias term so this activity is called as summation with bias term and on top of this to decide what is the output that i should give i'm going to have an activation so inside a single neuron two things takes place one summation and the another thing is activation you can think of this as what would happen in the single biological cell uh, that is inside the nucleus and this activation you can think about as what would happen at the axon terminals okay so uh, you like if you are someone from the biological background you can uh, do this uh, linkage okay and don't worry guys if you have no if you have not been following along with the comparison between biological neurons so only thing for you to remember is whenever i'm processing the information for a single neuron to get the output i'll take the dot product between my inputs and the weights and i'm going to add a bias term so if i want to represent it mathematically sigma of i is equal to 1 to m assuming that i'm having m inputs okay and inside the parenthesis i'm taking the dot product that means wi xi plus bias term that is b value okay and after the output we would get we are going to apply the activation function to decide what should be the output now this computation that you are seeing for a single neuron the same computation would happen on a bigger neural network as well so i mean whatever the computation that you had seen in the previous slide the same would be applicable here as well the same thing applies to every neuron in my hidden layer now in our scenario we'll be making use of our deep learning neural networks to perform the image processing that means for working with x-ray image now let's see how we can do that and how we can actually perform this uh, with image data using our deep learning now in order to work with image data we are going to make use of an architecture that is known as convolutional neural network and the reason that we would prefer using this convolutional neural network because if i'm using a traditional deep learning neural network whenever there is an uh, image for example whenever we are dealing with an image data obviously i cannot expect uh, every object is present in the same place in an image just to give you an example i can have a image where if i'm having a tree over here on my left side of this of this image and i can have one more image where my tree is present over here 
now if you look at it like in both the places or in both the images i'm having the same object that is tree but what happens if i'm making use of normal artificial neural network is whenever i'm having this image data uh, where my object is present in different parts of the image at each time this is going to treat it as a separate object and the deep learning tries to uh, find features features and features and it creates lots of uh, lots of features during the learning and because of this we are going to have very we are going to have lots of issues while working with image data which is an unstructured data now in order to avoid that we make use of this convolutional neural network now this convolutional neural network will work in a different way the like to give you an intuition we'll take a picture in our mobile mobile devices so do you agree with me guys so normally we'll we'll just take a picture in our mobile devices now after we take the picture what is the next activity that we do like when we take a selfie in our picture uh, before we uh, before we share it on a whatsapp or before we share it on our instagram or on facebook account why do we actually do it yes so we actually are going to make it to make it better i mean to make the object in that image to look better so how do we actually do it so we are going to apply various filters so i'll i like i'll readjust the image i'll i'll do i'll do some sort of activity over there and after i do that activity i'll be increasing the brightness of the object that is present in the image and sometimes i'll give the special effect for that image now that very thing that we have done over there that is to apply the filters so that is what would happen mathematically when i talk about convolution operation so convolution operation means adjusting thing or i can say modifying the pixel intensities for a given input image so that is what it would mean by performing the convolution operation now when we apply our image data on our convolution neural network what would happen in the back end is my neural network is going to apply various filters in the back end and by applying various filters in the back end it is going to learn the important features for a given input image now in this example i'm having an image of motorboat now i'll have a i'll have a some kind of a filter my convolution neural network will have this filter and it will use this filter and tries to apply some of the special effects so that it can learn okay if this is a motorboat so how does its edge would look like and if this is a boater boat uh, how does its top structure would look like it learns to identify various components for a given input image by doing this operation mathematical operation that is called as convolution okay so in reality we will have multiple convolution layers and when i say multiple convolution layers i'll do this uh, feature engineering activity multiple times so that i extract lots and lots of information from a given input data in case of convolution neural network architect architecture we'll have a convolution layer followed by a pooling layer and this pooling layer is like a, a layer which will help me in compressing the information that i'm having as a result of this convolution operation and once i have this series of convolution layers pooling layers convolution layers and pooling layers this will be connected to a fully connected layer which will help me in finally identifying the features that are present in my given image okay now that's the intuition behind our convolution neural networks okay now for the easier understanding you can think of this convolution uh, neural network working on the images as template matching so i'm having an image and let's say i'm having a template i'll move my template from left to right from top to bottom and i'll try to uh, check okay whether this given uh, whether it is matching my template so this is very uh, like you can use this image or you can use this as a very high level understanding as how this cnn would work guys now as i've mentioned already whenever i'm performing this convolution operation i'm going to modify the pixel intensities in a given image now in cnn we are going to call it as convolution filters now just like we have the filter in our mobile phone so in the same way so we are going to apply the filter on a given image now when it is applying the filter on a given image what it would actually do is 
it would actually place a filter so you can think of this filter as a some kind of a matrix a two dimensional matrix of the shape that we would specify whenever we are working and we'll place this filter on top of our pixel pixel area and we are going to take the dot product between those two uh, regions so that means 0 into minus 1 plus 75 into minus 2 plus 18 into minus 1 plus 75 into 1 plus 80 into 2 so plus 1 into 80 so if we do this activity that means like if we simplify this uh, if we simplify if we simplified everything we are going to get the output as 85 so what we have done over here is we have modified this particular pixel region which was 80 before into 85 now this is what would happen whenever we perform a convolution operation on a given image i'm going to change or i'm going to modify the pixel intensity of that particular pixel in an image and to do this i'm taking the dot product between my filter and sometimes we also call it as kernel as well i'm going to take a filter or a kernel and i'm going to take the dot product between my image region with my kernel region and once i do this activity multiple times i'll be changing the pixel intensities of those images now i'll use those uh, changed pixel intensities for my future learning in my deep learning neural network and once I have done this sufficiently, the common thing that we would perform is we are going to send this output of this convolution filters into a pooling layer. Now, in case of a pooling layer, it is very simple, guys. You can observe this slide for our intuitive understanding. Now, there are two types of pooling. One is max pooling, and another one is called as average pooling. Now this slide talks about an example for max pooling. So what we do in case of this max pooling is for a given input image, we will have some or the other pixel intensities. Let's assume these are the pixel intensities that we have for a given input image. Now while performing this pooling operation, we'll make use of a concept called pool size. Okay, pool size and sometimes we also call it as window size and this would most probably uh, have the window size of 2 by 2 unless and until we have researchers finding and we have for a different network in general we will have the pool size of 2 by 2 and we'll make use of stride as 2 okay so this is what happens in the back end so we will use this pool size of 2 by 2 which is a matrix and we'll place on top of our input image let's say if i place my input image over here now after i place my pool uh, that is select the region of 2 by 2 i'm going to see what is the maximum value of the pixel intensity that is present in my given input region now in this region the maximum value that we have is 6 so 6 is given as an output over here and similarly i'll place my uh, pool over here that is my pooling window over here and in this 4 by 4 in, in this 2 by 2 region the maximum value that i'm having is 9 so 9 will be the output from this region i'll place my window over here even in this scenario maximum value is 9 so 9 will be placed over here and for this region you can observe see this is the maximum value and 8 8 will be uh, uh, 8 is the next value guys okay now here I have mentioned something as stride okay so stride is nothing but the step size okay so it would mean that uh, like by default stride is equal to 1 now uh, if I like when I say stride is equal to 1 I'm going to move one pixel at a time moving from left to right and top to bottom now if I have uh, stride is equal to 3 I'll skip two steps and then select the third pixel while selecting my pooling window so that is the whole intuition behind working with pooling layer and one more thing if you had observed in the previous slide whenever we are performing this convolution operation if you observe at the end i'm losing a dimension along each axis see if you observe my input is of the dimension 5 by 5 now as a result of applying my filter of the size 3 by 3 i am losing the dimension 
like this like I'm doing I'm losing the dimension across each axis that is X and Y axis the reason that I'm losing this dimension because my my this kernel is of the shape 3 by 3 and I can place my kernel at the center of the 75 80 80 so I can place my 3 by 3 kernel only in my highlighting region I cannot place my kernel at the outside region now since since I'm unable to place my kernel in these outer regions I'm actually losing the dimension over here while performing this convolution operation now in order to avoid losing the dimension while performing this convolution operation we are going to make use of a layer which is called as padding layer now if you observe this see i'm having my original image which is of the shape 5 by 5 now i have added a padding layer over here so this shaded portion that you are seeing for a given image so these are the uh, pad, extra padding that I have added where the pixel intensities of those region will be equal to zero now by adding a padding layer over here for a given input image I'm I'm not losing the dimension even after I perform this convolution operation so that's the concept behind this uh, padding layer so we have learned about three important layers convolution layers and uh, uh, another thing that we had learned was uh, this pooling layer and next one is padding layer now in a given convolution uh, neural network architecture we'll have series of convolution neural networks followed by pooling operation followed by convolution operation and once we have once we are done with applying the series of convolution operation we are going to perform a flattening operation now this flattening operation is nothing but converting my multi-dimensional array into a single dimensional array that is the intuition behind uh, uh, flattening operation just to give you an intuition suppose if i'm having an array which is of the shape phi comma phi comma phi which is a three-dimensional array the resulting of my flattening operation will be it will create a single dimensional array where the total number of elements will be equal to 5 into 5 into 5 i think it will be equal to 125 elements so that is what would happen when i apply this flattening operation for a given pooling layer and then uh, if I want to show to you at a high level as how a common uh, convolution neural network would look like so I'll have my input image on my input image I'll perform series of convolution operation okay so in this scenario i have used the kernel of 5 by 5 and because of this i have my input image which was of the shape 28 by 28 has been changed to 24 into 24 and i'm having n1 channels which means i'm performing convolution uh, operation n1 times and after i perform my convolution operation i'm performing the max pooling operation with the max pooling pool size of 2 by 2 now as a result of applying this max pooling operation so the dimensions of my image have been reduced to 12 by 12 and on top of this i'm performing again convolution operation and this time it is also of the shape 5 by 5 kernel and then uh, this is the resulting shape and then i'm performing my max pooling layer and whatever the output that i'm getting over here as a result of this max pooling operation i'm converting into a flattening layer and once i convert into a flattening layer I'm connecting all those neurons into a fully connected neural network, which is a dense network. And then I'm going to have my output layer. Now, based on the activity that I'm performing, let's say if I'm performing the multi-class classification, I'll have the activation as softmax. If I'm performing a binary classification, I'll use the activation of sigmoid as per my requirement. Now, that is the high level uh, intuition behind given any convolution neural network now in our webinar we are going to perform this tumor detection using this convolutional neural network now to perform this brain tumor detection we'll make use of a concept that is called as transfer learning now in case of transfer learning what we'll be doing is we'll make use of the model which has been already trained for a given specific task and we'll use the already trained model and train it on a specific data set which we are interested in 
so an example can be something like this okay suppose if i'm having a requirement to detect whether my given input image has car or a truck okay if this is my task that i want to do now what i can do is i can make use of a deep learning model which has been already trained on a different data set but for the same type of data set an example can be something like this i am already having a deep learning model which has been already trained on a data set which is an image data set and this model has been trained to classify for a given image whether it belongs to cat or whether it belongs to dog okay so let's say this is the requirement that i'm having now this is my existing model that has been trained now what i can do is i can use this deep learning model which can identify whether a given input image has cat or dog i can use this model and on top of my already learned model i can create some additional layers deep learning neural network layers and train on my new data set that is new data set to identify for a given image whether it belongs to the class of car or truck so that is the advantage of using this transfer learning now by doing like this we will be reducing the amount of time that we have to spend on training and we are going to get higher accuracy while performing the uh, training guys so that's the advantage of using this transfer learning so this slide also gives more intuition behind this transfer learning so let's say i'm having data set one how uh, where i've create train my machine learning model one and i'm having my data set where i've trained my machine learning model two and in case of transfer learning we'll make use of the learning that we had from the model one which we got by training on top of our data set one and then use that learning to train our new data set two now in our scenario we'll make use of the convolution neural network architectures and uh, some of the common uh, cnn architectures that we have is uh, uh, like Linet architecture. So in case of Linet architecture, we'll have my input image and this is how various layers that we have. So like we'll have a convolution layers, series of uh, max pooling layer and then convolution layers and so on. And likewise, if I take another example of mobile net model architecture, this is how the architecture of my mobile net model would look like. So each of my uh, architecture will have its own settings when i say settings it expects the input in its own shape and it has its own set of convolution layers and it has its own set of dense layers and it has been prepared to do a specific task so what we'll be doing in our hands-on session is we'll make use of a, a convolution neural network which has been trained on a different data set okay that is on an imagenet data set and we'll make use of the pre-trained model and using that pre-trained model we are going to perform this activity of brain tumor detection okay all right now to get started i'm just uh, loading my data set the data set that i'm having it's already present in my dropbox so i'm loading directly from my dropbox so this is going to load my zip file which is present in my dropbox and it is going to do the unzip i'm just using my linux command and i'm removing this zip folder so that uh, i'll be saving the memory when i'm working with google collab instance okay so this has downloaded and it has also performed the extraction i can verify it by clicking on this file explorer okay so a new folder has been created so this folder is brain tumor data set and inside this folder i'm having two subfolders brain tumor and health is healthy and uh, if i expand this brain tumor so it has some set of data set see like i'll just download an example image guys okay so this is an example image which belongs to the cancer class which means this image or an x-ray image has a label of cancer which means okay this belongs to the cancer patient and i'll just open and sample data from an healthy images okay so this is an example image example x-ray image where it belongs to the healthy person okay so here i've got some question over here so how to add, uh, handle the imbalance real-time data set using transfer learning so when you're having an imbalanced data set we'll try to balance it out or we'll try to add the weights to those uh, classes 
so you can work on it uh, we can work we can work on it depending on the application that we have now after this i'm just importing my various libraries and i am uh, setting up my data so i'm just setting as okay where is my where exactly is my data set is present so i'm just i'm just specifying what is the folder path and i'm just counting how many number of images that i'm having in my given data set so in my case i'm having uh, 2513 images belonging to the brain tumor and 2087 images belong to the healthy patients now one common activity that we do whenever we are performing the training is we are going to split our data set into three parts so one is training data another is validation data and and the another set is test data we'll make use of our training set and the validation set during our training and after the training is complete we are going to make use of that test set to see as how our data set uh, how our model is working now uh, an example can be something like this so like for training you can think of it as a textbook where students use it to learn and for validation you can think of it as a preparatory exam to identify to measure as how the students is performing and test set you can think of it as a final exam as a final validation where we would use to measure as how the student is performing so in the same way to be able to have those data set we are just uh, creating the three subfolders as training set uh, validation set and the test set all right so i'm just creating three uh, subfolders and i'm just uh, uh, copying some of the images to those sub specific subfolders now after i have executed those it has created three folders over here test train and validation folder so i can access the folders of this train folder to perform the training and i can access this test folder to perform the testing and i can access the images in my validation to perform the validation for a given image data now to perform the training in this scenario we'll make use of tensorflow framework now from tensorflow this tensorflow actually provides a high level api which is known as keras so from keras i'm importing the various layers as per our requirement so these are some of the layers which I'm importing. I'm defining my model as sequential where I'm uh, placing one layer next to another and I'm loading some of the image pre-processing function that we have, which will help us in loading the data that is our image data. So I load my required libraries and this is going to take care of creation of my model. So for creation of model, I'm creating my model as sequential. Now to give you a high level understanding as what is sequential model sequential model is a type of a neural network where I'm having one layer stacked next to each other. So what this would actually mean is I'm defining my model as sequential and I'm saying it as model dot add con 2d. So my first layer is a convolution layers and this takes the input from the shape of 224 comma 224 comma 3. So let's say this is my input. This has the shape of 224 comma 224 comma 3 and this is connected to a convolution layer and then this is connected to another convolution layer which has filters of 32 and this is followed by max pool layer so if you look at it i'm placing one layer next to each other hence we call this model as a sequential model I'm defining my model and I'm uh, stacking one layer next to each other that is convolution layer max pool layer and so on and at the end I'm compiling my model which is a mandatory step that we have to do to tell our network okay as to tell our network as how it has to train during the training so in our scenario the model has the loss function as binary cross entropy optimizer which is the learning algorithm as adam which is one of the most commonly used learning algorithm and the metrics that we have is accuracy so if you are new to tensorflow i completely understand most of these terminologies would mean as a foreign language but uh, just be with me and uh, just be with me till the end you'll see as how the deep learning model which we actually train with few lines of code can or has the ability to differentiate for a given data guys okay all right so now that 
this would actually display the model summary how the shapes are getting changed uh, for given input data now as a part of next mandatory step i'm trying to create my training data generator object the reason that uh, this is being created because my data set or during the training of deep learning the normal thing if i don't use this data generator means it is going to load my entire data set into my ram so in order to avoid that issue the reason that we want to avoid this issue is in our example i'm having my total image size of 800 mb or something okay now i might not have issues when i'm training on my ram because i'm having close to 13 gb of ram so even if it uses 800 mb it won't be a concern but imagine this i'm having around 20 gb of image data now i cannot load all those 20 gb of my image data into my ram and start the training it would definitely cause uh, memory issues for the processing now in order to avoid that what we do is we are going to create this training generator objects which would actually help us in loading the data in the batches so each time using my generator i'm going to load the data in the batches an example can be in our scenario we are taking 32 images so i load 32 images from the hard disk to my ram i'll process those 32 images then i'll delete those 32 and i'll load a new batch so by doing like this i'll be efficiently freeing up my ram and my ram will be completely used for processing the information while that is during the computation and not on the data storage Hence, I'm creating my image data generator and I'm also specifying as how it has to flow from the directory like this. And I'm doing the same for my validation data and the test data. Now, in order to uh, uh, verify as how my model is performing during the training, I'm going to make use of model checkpointing and the early stopping. Now, using this technique, I'll be able to say my model once it has reached the good accuracy and I'll not be and I'll not be losing it after it has uh, left that good accuracy. So that is the reason I'm making use of this callbacks. And once everything is done, I'm going to perform this fit generator. So using this fit generator, we'll be able to fit the model with our data. When I say fit the model, I'll be training my deep learning neural network using my model uh, like I'll be training my neural net I'll be training my neural network to learn the various features that are given in the image and then we are we are actually saving that model in the back end and once we have saved it we are actually going to load the model and then we are going to check the accuracy as how it how our model is performing and finally we'll be able to test the model as how 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 uh, how our model is performing on the data set which is not seen yet okay so that is how we would do guys since uh, it's training a deep learning model to take a while for its for it to complete so the training is progressing for me so here if you i'll just show you as how to actually read these logs uh Okay, so the accuracy at start is 0.44, that is 44% accuracy. And then as we could see, with every epoch in the training, we could see that the loss is getting decreased and the accuracy is getting increased. Okay, so that is the best thing about training our deep learning models, guys. We can train our deep learning models to learn on a given data. Now in our scenario, uh, like we were able to reach the accuracy of 74.61%, and uh, since it did not reach further so we just stopped our execution and we have made sure that we have saved our best model okay so we have saved our best model now what we can do is after we have saved our best model we can load this model using a load model method that we have inside our tensorflow and then we can perform the evaluation on a new data so in our scenario the evaluation on the test data that we that we are getting is 72 percent accuracy and if you visualize as how the accuracy that we are getting during the training okay now I think it is saying as uh, i just have to change over here okay let me just give a different uh, image okay 
so I've given an image which is which belongs to the class of cancer and I have the output that says as the MRI image is of brain tumor okay so like that's what we have done guys so I I the only thing that I want you to change is in the last cell for the path make sure you replace it with this code to test it whether you are able to get this output or not okay the accuracy that we would get is obviously will not be 100% there could be a scenarios where even though my true values of my given input data would belong to the uh, cancer I might get an output as uh, it can like uh, as a healthy the reason because the model with which we have trained we have just trained for only few minutes and we have the accuracy of 74% on our validation data now to increase it so obviously we have to train for longer periods we have to uh, like increase the complexity of the model use multiple layers and sometimes if it's if it's still not increasing we can just increase the data images that we image image data set that we have and then we can see uh, whether our model accuracy is getting increased or not all right folks i hope this session has been helpful to you thank you for joining with us